Fletcher was the most battle-seasoned senior officer in Operation Watchtower. The experience of combat had taught him its costs. At both Coral Sea and Midway, he had had a great carrier, the Lexington and then the Yorktown sunk from under him. At a time when the Pacific carrier fleet numbered just four, three of which were assigned to Watchtower, he was fearful of further losses. During the day, the Enterprise, Wasp and Saratoga operated from a position about 25 miles south of the eastern end of Guadalcanal. From there, naval aircraft on patrol were but a quick few minutes from the beaches. Though Japanese planes from Rabaul, 600 miles away, would have little capacity to strike them even if they could find them, the danger posed by the Japanese carriers and submarines was considerable. The paramount question was whether the carriers were foremost in Fletcher's mind or the overall operation. In his original July 2nd operational order to Nimitz, King had specified the conditions under which the Joint Chiefs of Staff could order the carriers withdrawn. The withdrawal of the naval attached units of the US fleet may be ordered by the US Chiefs of Staff upon completion of any particular phase of the operation, in the event that conditions develop which unduly jeopardize the aircraft carriers, and an emergency arises in other Pacific areas which dictates such withdrawal. In King's view, completion of a particular phase of the operation, for instance, the landings, was a necessary precondition to a high-level decision to remove the carriers. Not even a serious threat to the carriers themselves excused their departure prior to the completion of a phase. Though it is unclear exactly what constituted a phase, and while the criteria for a withdrawal ordered by the JCS were not the same as for one ordered by the tactical commander, it does seem unlikely that Admiral King ever envisioned a withdrawal before the initial unloading of supplies was done. The second precondition allowing the carrier's withdrawal, undue jeopardy to them, required that Fletcher view his losses of fighter planes and consumption of fuel, both rather predictable outcomes of operations, as excessive. Fletcher was said to be the only US flag officer who understood that Watchtower would provoke the Japanese to a major naval counterattack. His major job, wrote author Richard B. Frank, was to win the carrier fleet action that would decide the fate of the Marines. If that was the case, it would have been reckless to risk his carriers before that threat actually appeared. He knew he would have to win that battle without ready reinforcement to make up his losses. No new carriers were due from the shipyards until late 1943. A well-situated referee to the controversy over Fletcher's decision-making was Marine Colonel Melvin J. Maas. If his position on Fletcher's staff makes his sympathy for his boss unsurprising, his status as a leatherneck inclined him to balanced perspective. He believed the only way the Japanese could retake Guadalcanal was through a major amphibious counter-offensive. Marines cannot be dislodged by bombers, Maas wrote. Because he saw the carriers as the key to preventing an enemy landing, he favoured a withdrawal of the carriers, even at the expense of his brothers. To be able to intercept and defeat Japanese troop landings, our carrier task forces must be fuelled and away so as not to be trapped here. By withdrawing to Noumea or Tongatabu, we can be in a position to intercept and pull a second midway on their carriers. If, however, we stay on here and then, getting very low on fuel, withdraw to meet our tankers, and if they should be torpedoed, our whole fleet would be caught helpless and would be cold meat for the Japs, with a resultant loss of our fleet, two, three of our carriers, and we would lose Tulagi as well, with all the marines there and perhaps all the transports. It is true, marines will take a pounding until their own air gets established, but they can dig in, hole up and wait, Extra losses are a localised operation. This is balanced against a potential national tragedy. Loss of our fleet or one or more of these carriers is a real worldwide tragedy. There is little doubt Fletcher's view of the situation off Guadalcanal took a serious accounting of the strategic significance of this scarcity of carrier power. So would go the debate. The amphibious commanders met on the evening of August 8th to discuss what to do. Kelly Turner summoning Vandergrift and Crutchley to his flagship, the Macaulay. Vandergrift arrived by launch from the beach. Shortly after 9pm, Crutchley, the cruiser force commander, pulled his flagship, the heavy cruiser Australia, out of formation in the southwestern covering force and set course for Lunga Point. This left the other two cruisers in that force, the Chicago and the Canberra, to guard that entrance to the sound.
Crutchley left the commander of the Chicago Captain Howard D. Bode in interim command of his group. The Australia anchored off Lunga Point, and Crutchley took a whaleboat to the Macaulay. During the meeting, Vandergrift was struck by both Turner's and Crutchley's absolute physical weariness. Two days of air attacks and continuous difficulties with logistics ashore had worn them down to the threshold of exhaustion. Turner announced a tentative decision that he had been reluctant to make. In view of Fletcher's withdrawal, he would remove the transports and all of the cargo ships from the area too. They would leave at sunrise on the 9th. Turner asked Vandergrift if enough stores had been unloaded to last his forces for a while. He asked Crutchley whether the cruiser screen could hold for a day or two without the protection of carrier-based fighter planes. Turner heard their grumbling affirmations and let's hope SOS and adjourned the meeting at 11.45. As the commanders took leave of Turner's flagship, the enemy's torpedoes were already in the water. If command is a lonely mountain, there were few peaks more more desolate than Howard D. Bode, the captain of the Chicago. Largely, it seemed, he liked it that way. It was common practice for a skipper to take all his meals alone in his cabin. This suited the ship's officers because Bode's manner was insulting and intimidating when he was not entirely aloof. He visited the wardroom only for meetings, and his presence always chilled the company. Bode could wield the chilling power by proxy. His officers were scared to death of him, said his marine orderly, Raymond Zarka. The minute I would walk in there, they would freeze like a bunch of frightened rabbits. According to an officer who knew him on another ship, he was short and stocky, and to a young ensign the most staggering thing about him was that he let his hair grow long enough so that it hung down over the collar of his service dress whites. He used to stick one of his hands in his blouse in front, and he postured a little like Napoleon postured and looked a little like I thought Napoleon was supposed to look. On the Chicago, officers who stood by their captain on watch and tried to be helpful did so at their peril. To give advice to a tyrant was to suggest his fallibility and offer oneself as a scapegoat should things go wrong. There were a few senior officers whom Bode outwardly respected, but he treated most of them in line with his whispered nicknames, Captain Bly and King Bode. Of the Pacific Fleet's 11 heavy cruisers, the Chicago ranked lowest for engineering performance, a fact that may have arisen in part from the unwillingness of his engineers to fudge fuel records, a technique sometimes used to mask actual consumption, but which might well have invited a stickler's wrath. He was bound for flag rank, had shaped his career toward that goal ever since he had survived some unpleasantness as a senior midshipman at the Naval Academy, a disciplinary proceeding for hazing, all of it duly reported on the front page of the Sunday New York Times. It was mortifying, but it didn't hold him back. He was a star, bound to command task groups and wear gold stars. The scuttlebutt on the Chicago had it that Bode was from money. The son of a Cincinnati judge, he had married into the DuPont family, and thus would have known the glamour of overseas capitals, even had his pre-war service as a naval attaché not taken him around the world. In that capacity, and later as a section chief in the Office of Naval Intelligence, he had become an expert in foreign intelligence. When Bode urged the disclosure to Pearl Harbor's commander of certain evidence that the berthing locations of vessels within the base were under scrutiny by Japanese agents, he reportedly clashed with Admiral Turner, a gambit for only the stoutest of heart. Turner, it was said, shut him down. His next assignment was to command the battleship Oklahoma, on December 7th, it was only through chance that he was ashore when Mitsubishi Crosshairs found his ship. The Oklahoma was heavily hit and capsized, killing almost half of her 864-man peacetime complement. Bode's absence spared his life. He and ten other men from the battleship transferred to the Chicago. On the night of August 8th, when Admiral Crutchley took the Australia out of the Southwestern Screening Force to confer with Turner, he signalled the Chicago by light, Take charge of patrol. I am closing CTF-62 and may or may not rejoin you later. With mere hours between the end of the conference and the rise of dawn, when the Australia and the other cruisers were supposed to go south to protect the transports, Crutchley saw no point in returning to his nighttime patrol station, and so Bode was alone again, in temporary command of a two-cruiser squadron guarding one of two routes into Savo Sound. The elevation to Commodore for a night was, he no doubt thought, a foretaste of duty to come. 
Bode had reckoned with the possibility of a ship-to-ship -ship fight against the Japanese on the night of August 8th. According to a sighting report from an Australian plane out of Milne Bay, New Guinea, the Japanese fleet was on the move. Recorded at 10.25 that morning but delivered near dusk, the report read, Aircraft reports three cruisers, three destroyers, two seaplane tenders or gunboats, 0549 S15607, Ecorse 120, true speed 15 knots. It was a curious report, vague as to ship type. When the Chicago's navigator plotted the coordinates of the enemy naval squadron, Bode's executive officer, Commander Cecil Adele, determined that it was too far away to reach the Chicago's patrol area before mid-morning on the following day. So it will be a quiet evening after all, Bode thought. Because the narrow waters between Guadalcanal and Savo Island were poorly charted, Bode had elected not to take the lead as befitted his command. Bringing his 600-foot-long heavy cruiser to the head of the truncated column would have required him to conduct a minuet of giants in perilously confined waters after dark. The Chicago's crew was on the brink of exhaustion after several days at battle stations. As soon as one attack ended, a warning of the next one usually followed. There would be a warning this night as well, or a hint of a warning, but it would be cried only faintly, and no one would seem to hear it or fathom it until it was too late. Admiral Mikawa was aware he had been spotted. One of his lookouts saw the plane that had betrayed him. Its appearance in the cloud gaps overhead persuaded him to reverse course in order to deceive the pilot that he was en route to Rabaul or Truk. But there was no need to fool an aviator who was already fooled. The pilot of the plane, a New Zealander named William Stutt, reported to his base at Milne Bay that the ship scribing white lines in the waters of New Georgia Sound might include two seaplane tenders or gunboats. These references to disparate ship types bewildered those receiving the report. Gunboats were not a recognised class of modern warship, though the term might suggest a small combatant such as a PT boat. Seaplane tenders were rarely mistaken for surface combatants of any kind. The ambiguity served to mask the actual lethal nature of Mikawa's striking force. Knowing nothing of Operation Watchtower in any event, Stutt was not predisposed to alarm. His report languished for hours at his base, and then for hours more at Brisbane, and finally reached Turner and Crutchley between 6 and 7 p.m. with its reference to seaplane tenders, it failed to arouse the suspicions it ought to have. Turner surmised that the enemy's mission was to establish a seaplane base near Ricata Bay, off the northern tip of Santa Isabel Island. Continuing to vary his course to mask his purpose, Mikawa ordered his cruisers to launch search planes to survey the waters ahead. Within a few hours their reports would come back. Off Guadalcanal, 15 transports, a battleship, four cruisers, seven destroyers and an auxiliary carrier. Off Tulagi, two heavy cruisers, 12 destroyers and three transports. At a quarter to five, Mikawa signalled the battle plan to each of the ships. We will penetrate south of Savo Island and torpedo the enemy main force off Guadalcanal. Then we will move toward the forward area at Tulagi and strike with torpedoes and gunfire after which we will withdraw to the north of Savo Island. Mikawa knew nothing of Fletcher's plan to withdraw. His only sure evidence of the threat posed by US carriers was the chatter of American pilots that his radio men were intercepting. To avoid that threat, he would have to strike under cover of darkness. He calculated that as long as the fight began before 1.30 a.m., his force on withdrawal would be outside the range of US carrier planes come daylight. On came Mikawa's column at 24 knots, the flagship Chokai in the lead, followed at 1,300-yard intervals by the heavy cruisers Kako, Kinugasa, Aoba, Furutaka, then the smaller Tenryu, Yubari and Yunagi. Preparing his lunge into the American anchorage, Mikawa ordered his commanders to jettison all flammables. From the signal yards of each ship rose long white battle streamers that whipped the air. Back at Truk, Admiral Ugaki spent the day relishing the thought of what was coming. The 8th Fleet is going to surprise the enemy in Guadalcanal tonight. Come on, boys. Do your stuff. The HMS Canberra led the Chicago in column with the destroyers Bagley and Patterson along a northwest to southeast patrol line, reversing course by a column turn every 45 minutes. To give the weary crews some relief, the ships were in what was known as Condition 2, 
a state of partial battle readiness that kept one of the cruiser's two forward turrets fully manned, and the after turret half manned. Bode was reassured to know that both Crutchley and Turner had received the same contact report he had. In Turner's judgment, the reference to seaplane tenders suggested the ships were bound for a quiet anchorage north of Guadalcanal where the Japanese had a seaplane base. As for the threat of enemy surface ships, Turner was unconcerned. He had told Crutchley that he was comfortable with the disposition of the cruisers to protect the anchorage. I was satisfied with arrangements and hoped that the enemy would attack, Turner later wrote. I believed they would get a warm reception. While Turner was with Crutchley and Vandegrift, a Japanese aircraft, a float plane from one of Mikawa's cruisers, revealed itself to spotters on the Ralph Talbot, running low, flying east over Savo Island. The destroyer announced, Warning, warning, plane over Savo Island headed east. The message was repeated on several radio frequencies. It shouldn't have been news. Word had arrived hours before from the San Juan, leading three destroyers on patrol off Tulagi, that an unidentified plane had been sighted over Savo Island. The picket destroyer Blue saw it too. That ship's gunnery officer asked his captain for permission to open fire, but since the plane was displaying running lights, it was deemed a friendly. The Blue's skipper feared that if he reported the plane by radio, he would only risk the Japanese detecting his ship's location by radio direction finder. Fear of using sensors and communications was widespread in the screening force. When Captain Bode retired to his cabin behind the pilot house for a nap, confident no attack could come that night, he ordered his radar officer to turn off the Chicago search radar for fear that Japanese ships might detect and trace the beams. Rains were moving over the cloistered waters around Savo. Lightning flickered sporadically. It was 1.42 a.m. when the Chicago's lookouts reported orange flashes of light against Savo's shadow. To Bode and the men of the bridge watch, they looked like fires on the beach. A minute later, the plane that was lazing in circles overhead began dropping flares. Five blinding orbs burst well astern, near the transport anchorage off Tulagi. From the destroyer, Patterson ahead, came a blinker signal. Warning! Warning! Strange ships entering harbour. Out in the storm-lit sound, the forms of unidentified ships were dimly visible, approaching nearly head-on. The Patterson's battery barked, lofting star shells aiming to backlight the bogies. The Chicago followed suit, but her phosphorus candles failed to light. Critical minutes passed in the dark. The Bagley swung left, drew on the enemy, and fired four torpedoes from her starboard battery. Seeing targets against the glow of his star shells, Commander Frank R. Walker ordered the Patterson's helm left and shouted an order to launch torpedoes, but the crashes of her gun battery swallowed it. Then Bode heard a report of torpedoes in the water, inbound on several bearings. Ahead, the Canberra was seen turning sharply to starboard, when a cry came of a torpedo wake headed for the port bow. Bode ordered his rudder hard to port as the Chicago's engineers, deep in the ship, laboured to answer the bell to make full speed. Noticing a quick, bright exchange of gunfire to the west, Bode steered the Chicago on what he thought was a good course for engaging both turrets and broadside. As his ship came to 25 knots, Bode was still seeking his enemy when, without fanfare or forewarning, the Canberra was savaged by a concentrated barrage. More than 30 Japanese shells struck the Australian heavy cruiser, killing her commander, Captain Frank E. Getting, and other senior officers. Almost at once both of her boiler rooms were destroyed, and with them died all power and light throughout ship. She was a floating nest of flame. In this fleeting moment of contact, the Chicago never did fire her main battery. A shell struck the leg of her mainmast, killing two sailors, including the chief boatswain's mate, and wounding thirteen, including the exec, Commander Adele, who was hit in the throat. A torpedo fired by the Kako struck the ship from starboard, clipping off part of the bow and vibrating the rest of the ship hard enough to disjoin the main battery director. Gunners on her five-inch secondary battery managed to train on and hit an enemy ship, the Tenryu, killing 23 men. But the darkness hid the larger targets. Of the 44 star shells the Chicago lofted, all but six failed to light. As Bode struggled to decide what to do next, he neglected to report the encounter either to his absent superior, Crutchley, 
or to his colleague who would be up next in the shooting gallery, Captain Reefcole in the Vincennes, flagship of the Northern Cruiser Group. As the Japanese column steamed by, rounding Savo Island in a counterclockwise course and approaching Reefcole's squadron, Bode continued west toward what he thought would be the arena of the principal fight. Afterward, the track charts of the battle would show with cruel clarity that this is not at all what Bode was accomplishing. The record would even suggest, to the uncharitable eyes of inquiring superiors, that the star skipper of the cruiser Chicago was in the grip of an emotion quite distinct from courage. On a night when the American fleet would need all the best virtues of its commanders, officers and men to join together, Bode had committed the first in a swift accumulation of errors. Admiral Mikawa had won the draw and, continuing to the east, found Frederick Reefcall's cruisers, majestic on patrol, but no more alert than the wayward watchdogs of the southwestern force had been, despite the spectacular catastrophe of the preceding 400 seconds. East of Savo, twenty miles astern of Captain Bode's westward-charging warship, the nighttime cloud cover was cast into grey relief by intermittent lightning and the distant flashing of gunfire. On a calm sea, the cruisers Vincennes, Quincy and Astoria were tracing the northwesterly leg of a box-shaped patrol pattern five miles on a side. Their officers were alert to the light, but unaware of its source. They did not know that a critical alarm had already been raised. Captain William Greenman of the Astoria was steaming as closely as he thought prudent to the Quincy ahead, in order to get maximum protection from his threadbare anti-submarine screen. With only two destroyers, the Wilson and the Helm, leading them in the van, his greatest fear was submarine attack. On August 6th, Nimitz had sent ultra-secret warnings to all his Operation Watchtower commanders regarding the submarine threat. On the evening before the battle, Turner had instructed Crutchley to discontinue using his shipboard floatplanes to search the slot for enemy ships. The undersea menace loomed largest. Now came a radio warning delivered by a destroyer from the Southern Screening Group, the Patterson. Warning, warning, strange ships. What to make of this? Transmitted at 1.47am, the warning had been missed altogether by Captain Reefcole in the Vincennes. The TBS frequency was clogged with commanders exchanging the administrivia of the midwatch. It had been burdened most of the night by the chatter of destroyer officers wondering how to approach the task of scuttling the transport George F. Elliott hit in the afternoon air attack. Though the bridge watch on the Quincy received the warning and sounded general quarters, the reason for the alarm was not immediately conveyed to the ship's gunnery control stations. In the Astoria, a petty officer named George L. Coleman, stationed in the plotting room beneath the bridge, trained his search radar to the west and reported a bogey approaching on the surface at 29 miles. Though Savo Island's mass blocked the radar's field of vision within a 25-degree arc off either shore, Coleman registered contacts and reported them to higher command. The fire control radar was out of order at the time, but Coleman had faith in his longer-range search set. The search radar was operating as well as it ever had, Ensign R.G. Henneberger, the Astoria's radar officer, would write. When the officer of the deck refused to sound general quarters, Coleman pressed his case. The more I insisted that the enemy was out there, the more I got excited, Coleman wrote. Still, the unfamiliar power of a new technology was seldom a match for a complacent human mind bent on ignoring it. The OOD and the other officers tried to tell me that I had a double echo on my scope and that we had a destroyer in that area. Coleman said. He made such a nuisance of himself after his relief by the mid-watch that someone finally threatened to send him to the brig if he didn't let the next watch settle in and do their jobs. The first irrefutable sign that enemy ships were near came when searchlights fixed on Reef Cole's slumbering formation and a heavy salvo raised the seas just short of the Vincennes. No one, not even the officer whose duty it was to expect the worst, Reef Cole, believed a Japanese fleet could reach them before morning. Sweeping the horizon through his glass, the executive officer of the Vincennes spotted a glow of light and silhouettes on the water, about four miles on his port beam. The great display of light blooming in the haze was the product of the high halo of a star shell. The gunnery officer believed it was from the flash of American gunfire bombarding shore. The Astoria's captain, Greenman, too, was fooled by the evidence before his eyes. 
When he was roused to a view of Bode's southern group dying in the dark, he said, I didn't know they were shelling the beaches tonight, and returned to his cabin. But even when the shock of heavy underwater explosions came, the throes of Bode's squadron could too easily be dismissed by the most plausible explanation. The detonations of depth charges dropped by destroyers hunting submarines. Captain Greenman was unaware of the discord in his pilot house concerning purported radar contacts. Had he been awake, he might have heard through the open hatch the argument between one of the two quartermasters of the watch, Royal Radke, who heard a plane overhead and asked permission to pull the general alarm, and the officer of the deck, a young lieutenant who declared such an action the captain's prerogative. Radke wasn't standing on ceremony when a decision might determine life or death. Without further deliberation or entreaty, he pulled the red lever. Some would say that this act of insubordination ended up saving more than a few American lives. Having dealt with Bode's force in summary violent fashion, the four Japanese cruisers, the Chokai leading the Aoba, Kako and Kinugasa, swept along to the northeast. The Kinugasa was still dealing fire at the ruined Canberra when the Chokai ahead fixed her searchlights on the Astoria, last in Captain Reefcall's column, and 8,200 yards or four and a half miles to the northeast. The Aoba lit the Quincy and the Kako took the Vincennes. Mikawa's gunners were turning their batteries on the American column when the lieutenant in the Astoria's main battery director, Carl Sander, found himself studying a strange cruiser through his spotting glasses. Recognising foreign architecture, he shouted into the phones, Action port! Load! As Sander coached the boxy bulk of his gun director onto the target, his gunnery officer, Lieutenant Commander Truesdell, in sky control high in the foremast, saw searchlights probing out of the darkness to port. He shouted, Fire every damn thing you got! Awakened, Greenman reached the bridge shortly after Astoria had let loose her first salvo. Who sounded the general alarm? He demanded to know. Who gave the order to commence firing? Greenman thought the worst, not an enemy attack but a blunder of fratricide. When the second salvo blew, the captain feared his gunners were firing into friendly ships. The quartermaster, Radke, was still catching hell from the skipper when a report came that the five-inch gun deck was on fire. Only when an experienced voice such as Truesdell's had confirmed that the ships illuminating them were hostile did Greenman let his gunners do their work. From that moment on, the Astoria roared. Feeling the lurching of the ship and watching yellow light flash through the slats of the porthole to his sleeping compartment, Joe Custer knew suddenly that he would not escape the battle unhurt. It was there, as vivid and clear as though someone had told me, he wrote. For a moment he was frantic to know where the injury would strike him, but then he understood there was little use fretting over what he couldn't control. I was suddenly cool and calm. What is to be, is to be. Running to the weather deck, a radio department officer, Lieutenant Jack Gibson, was surprised to see that we were fixed by a searchlight like a bug on a pin. Like her two consorts, the Vincennes and the Quincy, the Astoria seemed to come to fighting life when her guns opened up. But enemy gunners were several turns ahead of the Americans in the cycle of loading, fire and correction of aim. Two hundred yards ahead of the Astoria and five hundred yards to port, a tight group of splashes rose, short. The next group fell a hundred yards closer ahead, five hundred short. The Astoria responded and then a third salvo fell directly a beam to port, but still 500 yards short. Tracking targets that were running on a course opposite her own, the Astoria's director-controlled turrets swivelled after until they hit the stops that kept them from blasting her own superstructure. The fourth salvo from the Japanese reached out 300 yards closer aboard. Finally, after the fifth enemy salvo, Admiral Turner's old ship took one square amidships in the aircraft hangar. There was a sublime absurdity to the process by which a US warship roused itself to action. When the general quarters or battle stations alarm rang, men assigned to a particular station on routine watch were replaced by men assigned to that same station to do battle. The replacement of watch personnel by general quarters personnel was wholesale, including key people such as the supervisor of the watch, the officer of the deck, the junior officer of the deck, the helmsman, and all the talkers assigned to the phones on the bridge. Every one of these people changed stations when the general alarm sounded. Though a well-drilled crew could complete the scramble within short minutes, 
The procedure ensured that officers and crew spent precious, perhaps decisive minutes scrambling, not fighting. It was like a game of musical chairs, begun precisely in that critical moment when seconds weighed most heavily and the marginal cost of a lapse was highest. A gunner's mate standing watch in the forward anti-aircraft director, known as Sky Forward, had a difficult course to run after the alarm sounded. He had to scramble down a warren of ladders and passageways to the armoury, retrieve the key to the five-inch magazine, run to the magazine, unlock it for the handling crew, then run back up to the flight deck and stand by to launch aircraft from the catapult. All of this had to be done in three minutes. A stupid setup, an Astoria sailor would say. By the time I started my descent, the ship had been hit by several salvos and was on fire below. Surprise was lethal to a ship that operated under such a system. When ladders between decks were blown away, crews had no way to reach their stations. Lieutenant Jack Gibson, the radio officer, was witness to this absurd and tragic chaos. The Astoria was shuddering from heavy hits and the repercussion of her own gunfire, he wrote. The air was filled with shrapnel that was clanging against the bulkheads, and the well deck, as I passed over it, was strewn with bodies of fallen men. I crouched down to the level of the metal railing, then clambered up to the hangar deck. Up there I was struck by the full glare of the Jap searchlights, and between that and the whizzings and ringings of metal all around me, I suddenly felt as if the fury of the whole war had been turned on me. Gibson bucked up his courage and continued to climb. One more crossing, another ladder, and I was at my station and out of the light. A burst of shells followed me through the door. They pierced the hangar deck and set the launches on fire. Then the planes began to burn. Their gas tanks caught fire and spread the flames. Another shell hit the base of the starboard aircraft catapult, ploughed across the well deck and exploded in or under the galley, setting afire the starboard side of the well deck and igniting the plane on the starboard catapult. A hard lesson came now. The Achilles heel of a cruiser in battle was the highly flammable realm of her shipboard aviation division, in modern navies, cruisers carried catapult-launched float planes for reconnaissance and gunfire spotting. The traditionalists bemoaned the oil stains the aircraft left on their ship's polished teak. Untended planes could do far worse under fire. They made their hosts into tinderboxes. Hangars were rich with flammables, spare wings, drums of lubricating oil, gasoline and ordnance. The simple act of launching the aircraft unmanned into the sea and jettisoning their combustibles as the Japanese had already done, would have paid a great dividend. Pacific Fleet Headquarters had considered the risks and left the decision to discard the planes to the personal discretion of commanders. The hangars were fuses to countless other flammables. Paint, paper, furniture and exposed crates of ready-service ammunition in nearby gun mounts. Steel and wire and cork and glass, all of it burned readily. The heat of the fires was sometimes intense enough to ignite paint on bulkheads two compartments away. The burning paint ferried flames through the compartments. Vital sprinkler systems were distributed by long runs of piping, exposed and vulnerable to shell fire, shock and shrapnel. Fire mains, centrally fed and routed, could fail ship-wide with a single hit in the wrong place. High-velocity fragments ignited the crates of powder and ordnance stacked on the gun deck, Five-inch shells were set off like rockets or sat there and burned, igniting other charges or causing the projectiles themselves to explode. Custer was watching one of the boxes burn as a sailor played a stream from a fire hose over it. In a few minutes the stream grew feeble, stopped altogether, the power was off. The sailor moved away with the hose and I edged forward for a better view of the flaming gun deck below. There was a tremendous white flash, a huge sheet of flame, then crimson spurts flaring in all directions. I heard the whir-whir of shrapnel on all sides, and suddenly I felt a hot piercing stab of pain in my left eye. Shooting stars sprayed in violent streaks. Feeling for his wound and smearing red streaks across his cheek, he thought, I'll never see Hawaii again. Custer's thinking ran to distraction. So this is how it feels to die, he thought, even as he rebuked himself for his dramatics. Robert E. Riddell, a gunner's mate, was awakened by flares as he slept near his station, a one-inch quad mount forward on the port side. He told his trainer, F.C. Loomer, to train on a searchlight to port. 
Coaching onto his target, Riddell pulled the firing lever and rattled away for a while. The light went out, another appeared, and he had no sooner nudged Luma's shoulder to change targets when time stopped and the world went black. When Riddell came to, he found that his legs wouldn't take his weight, and that whatever had taken out his legs out had drilled Luma straight through the torso. As the Astoria shuddered, the Vincennes took several devastating shell hits from the Kako. These first hits were critical, striking the bridge on the port side, killing the communications officer and two men in the pilot house. Hits came by the dozen now, the price of being enveloped after Mikawa's single column of ships separated into two parallel columns during the rush of battle manoeuvres. The Americans were caught in the crossfire by gunners who could see their every burning move. Somewhere between 75 and 100 medium-caliber shells found Reef Cole's ship. The Japanese 8-inch projectiles were set to explode after travelling an average of 60 feet following penetration. Grievous as those internal wounds were, torpedoes were far worse. Hitting below the waterline, they turned the pressure of the heavy sea itself into a lethal weapon. The quick use of torpedoes was a signature Japanese tactic. IJN torpedo officers were taught to hold their fire until everything, slow fish and fast shells, could hit all at once. According to Raizo Tanaka, a rear admiral who pioneered the proactive use of destroyers in night combat, an ideal torpedo man is full of aggressive spirit and has a strong sense of responsibility and pride in his work. IJN destroyer commanders were skilled ship handlers all, the Navy's crack night combat force, and brilliant torpedo experts. According to Tanaka, from top to bottom the training and discipline of the crews was flawless. Operational orders could be conveyed by the simplest of signals, and they were never misunderstood. Several torpedoes hit the Vincennes from the port side, the blasts, amplified by the weight of the water, struck at the vital innards of a ship. When in rushing water killed the electrical system feeding the Vincennes' main battery and silenced her circuits of internal communication, Captain Reefcole was unable to talk to his engine room, to the officers in central station, or the gunnery team in main battery control. He could not signal his following ships. In the course of the short 20-minute contest, the flagship would manage just two nine-gun salvos, both to port, and two six-gun salvos to starboard. Her battle was quickly and mercifully over. The gunfire of Mikawa's turret captains was aimed with uncanny accuracy. Six of the nine eight-inch turrets on the three US cruisers were disabled by direct hits. Though Reefcole must have known that his enemies lurked on all bearings, in the disbelieving first minutes he never quite shook the belief that he was under attack by friendly ships. He blinkered entreaties to them and hoisted colours, bright in the glare of hostile searchlights, meaning to suggest that this was all a mistake. It all was a mistake, but not the kind the Commodore imagined. From the perspective of Toshikazu Omai, Mikawa's chief of staff in the Chokai, the Americans were like targets in a gallery. There were explosions everywhere. Every torpedo and every round of gunfire seemed to be hitting a mark. Enemy ships seemed to be sinking on every hand. About eight minutes after landing their first hits on the Vincennes, the Kako and Kinugasa shifted to the Astoria, last in the staggering American line. The Furutaka and Yubari picked up the Vincennes by the light of her fires and the Furutaka's searchlight. Reef Cole's destroyers, the Wilson and Helm, could do little to save her. When the Wilson, riding on the starboard bow of the Vincennes, turned left to close with the enemy, she found the US cruisers blocking her approach. Tactical prudence kept her from firing torpedoes in the proximity of friendly ships, and their flames blinded her to any targets. With the nearby mass of Savo Island lying in the line of sight behind Mikawa's ships, the Wilson's radar could not register accurately. She fired her four five-inch guns in a rocking ladder, back and forth over the range that was shown by her stereoscopic rangefinder, about 12,000 yards. Most of the rounds the Wilson fired, more than 200 of them, were anti-aircraft rounds with fuses set on safe. Time rushed by to the point of vertigo, and even the Wilson's clocks surrendered to the chaos. Times in the above narrative are approximate, the captain wrote after the action, for the hands on the bridge clock fell off on our first salvo, and it was not realised that the quartermaster was not making exact time records of the occurrences until some time later. The helm, steaming on the port bow of the Vincennes, 
fired just four rounds at the Japanese for want of visible targets. Several fires were already burning on the Quincy, courtesy of the Aoba's third salvo. The ships after turret took a hit in the faceplate, dislodging a large piece of armour and jamming the turret in train. An aircraft on the port catapult ignited. Her two forward turrets got off three salvos each before turret two was hit and burned out, killing everyone inside. On the Astoria, Keithel P. Anthony, a water tender, was racing through the machine shop, aiming to reach the ladder that descended to the number three fire room, when a powerful kinetic force seized the whole bulkhead in front of him and swung it into his path. He was standing there perplexed, his way blocked, when a lieutenant named Thompson found him and said, There are men in the forward mess hall who need help. Will you go with me? Anthony assented and, strapping a gas mask over the top of his head, was preparing to venture forward when another explosion bedazzled him. The lights went out, and there were millions of sparks everywhere, like electrocution. I was knocked out and don't know how long I laid there on the deck. When I came to, there wasn't a soul moving in the compartment. When Anthony saw Lieutenant Thompson again, he was dead, blown clear through a wire mesh and his body wrapped around the main steam stack, his left arm and leg useless, bleeding and in severe pain, Anthony entered the machine shop and found bodies two men deep. He wondered how he had survived, and soon found that it was only because he had somehow managed to snap the chin strap of his gas mask that he would live with the curse of being a sole survivor. Poisonous gases killed everyone else. Anthony pulled himself through an escape hatch to the main deck by the starboard side galley. I sat there and listened to hits coming in left and right overhead. Everything was burning. Lieutenant Jack Gibson described a roar like an express train in a tunnel as a Japanese shell hit the main battery director's control station. It came right through it, clipping off the steel stem of the sight setter's stool and dropping him swearing to the deck. In the half dark, I could see him clawing at the rear of his pants to find out if he was all there. A voice with a Tennessee twang drawled, That'll teach you not to be set in when your betters are left standing up. We didn't have long to laugh, Gibson wrote. Our director was so jammed we couldn't move it. Bathed in the glare of the enemy's carbon arcs, Joe Custer was lazily aware of men huddled around him. From them came an overtone of muffled sounds like mumbled prayers, he wrote. There was a crash of an exploding shell right around my ears, and the sudden rat-tat-tat of unseen fragments ricocheting all about me, like steel popcorn sprayed up against the inside walls of a cage. I couldn't see them, but I could hear them whistling by and spattering off the overhead. He remembered his premonition that he would be wounded, but realised then too that he would not die. The chief radio man guided him past a large gash in the deck and seated him behind turret two, which provided a loom of shelter even as it shattered his world now and then with blasts from its three muzzles. Then the chief led him down a boom to the main deck, but then turret two raged again, producing a crushing explosion right above him. The deck heaved as Custer shuffled down the boom, using his hearing to gauge his progress. Look out for my leg, a sailor nearby said. Custer forced his good eye open and saw through his own blood a chubby sailor in dungarees, his right leg hanging by a shred below the knee. As the sailor sat down on the forecastle, soaked in gore, Custer wondered how the end would feel. If I have to go, he thought, let it be quickly. Lieutenant Gibson, stationed in the main battery director, could scarcely stand from the slippery blood on the metal deck. In flashes of light I could see some of my men, dead with their earphones still on. They had stepped to the door to see what was happening and had taken shrapnel through the chest. The smoke and heat were unbearable in our iron box, but we still tried to get our guns into play. First-class fire controlman Wade Johns reported huskily, I can see him, sir. It was more than I could do. My gun pointer and gun trainer were at their places, straining to get their cross wires lined up, and my sight setter sat on his metal stool. I noticed wounded men on the floor trying to drag themselves up to their posts. The sixth salvo hit Astoria's turret one, forwardmost on the forecastle. It absorbed three projectiles, including two to the barbette below the gun house, and one straight through the eight inch thick Class B armour on the faceplate, killing almost everybody inside. The hits came fast and furious for the next few minutes, 
slowly disabling the ship's fire control apparatus. When turret 2 jammed in train, Captain Greenman found he could only direct his guns by turning the ship's rudder. As he ordered the helm around to enable the jammed battery to match bearings with the director, the Astoria's twelfth and final salvo was fired, rather futilely, by local control. The Astoria's engineers struggled to coax full battle speed out of the besieged ship. The chief water tender, Milton Kimbrough Smith, had just lit off the two standby boilers in the number three fire room. He was still looking to bring them online when an explosion rocked the compartment. Shrapnel rained down through the gauges of a control panel. Smoke washed over him, funneled down through the ventilation blowers. At the main generator board in the forward engine room, Chief Electrician's mate Gilbert G. Dietz heard scuttlebutt that the topside decks were awash with flames. The compartment directly above him was trembling from repeated impacts. The blowers were fighting a losing battle to bring breathable air below. Sparks showered around him, and circuit breakers jumped out. The engineering spaces, fully dependent on forced ventilation, were choked from above. The Astoria had reached 15 knots when her power plant began to fail. Men without masks gasped and fell to the deck, grating, struggling. Smith cut the supply of fuel oil to the burners and sounded the emergency alarm. Crew in the number two fire room succumbed to waves of smoke. Shrapnel rained in a hail down the blower trunk. The heat forced the crew in the after engine room to abandon station. When a shell penetrated a kerosene tank en route to exploding in the after mess hall, the combustible liquid leaked all over the well deck. It caught fire and flowed through a hole in the main deck, spreading below. A fire room, an engine room, two more fire rooms, and another engine room. They died in that order. Soon the Astoria was coasting to a tortured stop. Matthew J. Buters, the Astoria's junior chaplain, described a din of steel piercing steel in a shower of fire and lightning bolts and the groans of a great ship in her death throes. The steel bulkheads were alive with that lightning as they bled streaks of fire. Smoke was everywhere, and it overcame him. I became aware I couldn't hold my breath any longer, Buters recalled. By 2.8am Greenman's ship was down to seven knots. He could see the Vincennes in the lead, brightly ablaze amidships, just as bad off as his ship was. On the port bow, swinging right, appeared the Quincy. A wholesale mass of fire, Captain Samuel N. Moore's ship was still firing intermittently. Greenman could see that as the Astoria drew ahead of the Quincy, he was at risk not only of moving into her line of fire, but of a collision too. He ordered a hard right turn to let the Quincy draw ahead. With the turn, the Japanese ships the Astoria was firing on passed astern. Tracking them, Commander Truesdell in the forward main battery director found he couldn't see past the large fire amidships. He ordered control passed to director two aft, but they were blind as well. Just as the Astoria passed the Quincy to starboard, a salvo struck the Astoria on the starboard side of the bridge superstructure, hitting the Polaris. Quartermaster Donald Yeamans was thrown ten feet and hit the deck with his right eardrum blown out. The blast felled the entire bridge watch to their knees, killing the navigator and several others. The ship careened for a time, guideless. Then the boatswain's mate, dizzied, regained the helm, turning left on orders from Greenman, trying to find the Quincy and reform the column. When the boatswain told his captain he was feeling weak and couldn't hold on, Greenman ordered steering control shifted to central station and tried to con by telephone. He wanted to order a southerly zigzag course toward the transport anchorage, but Yeamans, his talker, found that the phone line was dead. The officer in command of central station, far below decks, Lieutenant Commander James Topper, felt a heavy vibration and a sickening rattle of metal. Blind to it all, connected by wires and tubes and voice lines, he tried to direct the fight to save stations he could not see. As thermostats in the fire alarm systems went out and alarm bells began ringing, electricians moved about, shifting circuits to determine which were working and which were gone. Topper heard a series of grim announcements, the boat deck, an inferno, wounded men on the bridge. Turret 1 hit heavily with few, if any, survivors. Three more explosions and Radio 1 was out. Another shattering hit and the number one fire room was gone. An engine room was full of smoke. The after control station commanded by the ship's executive officer Battle 2 was threatened by fires. Topper ordered a crew from the forward repair party to go topside and join the fight to save the ship.
Then a shell came rattling down the armoured escape trunk that reached from the foremast to the hull bottom. It exploded atop Central Station's armoured hatch. The watertight seal, flash-fired, flinched. A metal seam opened up, admitting a gust of toxic smoke. Pieces of sparking metal, burning rubber and debris rained down from above. All hands put handkerchiefs to their faces and stuffed rags into ducts to little avail. When their request to abandon station was denied, all hands put on gas masks. The chief electrician, Halligan, grabbed a fire extinguisher and played it upon the debris. Then another projectile penetrated the ship's port side and exploded against the barbette to turret too, giving them other things to worry about. As the Astoria slid to a stop, her bow reaching for the new course, a searchlight appeared on the port beam. Lieutenant Commander Davidson climbed up to trainer's window of turret two and coached the damaged triple mount onto the tormenting light. As far as Greenman knew, it was the last turret he had. The large fires amidships kept him from being able to see whether the after main turret was still firing, but Greenman could follow his shells as they flew and could see them hit. One of the Astoria's salvos missed its target, the Kinugasa, and struck another cruiser, the Chokai, on her forward turret. The momentary suppression of the Japanese flagship's fire did the Astoria little good. When Greenman asked what speed the ship could make, the answer from what was left of his engineering division was, none. She was dead in the water. At about 2.15, the avalanche of shellfire engulfing the Astoria relented. The flashes receded and the roar of shelling died. Splashes became intermittent. Then the gunfire ceased. Further shooting at the Astoria would have been gratuitous on the part of the Japanese. Fires were eating her within and above. Her engineers advised Greenman that the choked and burning engineering spaces should be abandoned. On board the two other American cruisers, similar discussions were taking place. At 2.30, with his port side opened up to the sea, Reef Call passed the order to abandon ship. Shortly before 3 a.m., the Vincennes turned turtle. The captain was nearly felled by the mast of his capsizing ship smacking the water. In an unceremonial plunge, the Vincennes went down by the head. For the Quincy, like the Astoria, a sudden violent crash of enemy steel into the hangar deck had been the inciting catastrophe. She carried five airplanes aboard, one SOC Seagull mounted on each catapult, another float plane secured on the well deck, and two more parked in the hangar. All of them should have been somewhere else, if not airborne on patrol, then at the bottom of Savo Sound, flung away as a safeguard against fire. It was unfortunate that the rolling steel curtain that enclosed the Quincy's aircraft hangar had been removed the previous day, damaged by the shocks of her shore bombardment. The price of this accident was paid as soon as the Aoba's first shells hit, a contagious wash of fire over the well deck, and four of the five seagulls brightly aflame. They could not be jettisoned while burning. By the time the fire hoses were rigged, there was no pressure left on the line. The fires, unchecked, were a gift to the Japanese. Their spotters and fire controlmen could switch off their searchlights, hide in the dark, and train on the illumination offered by the Quincy herself, as they did with the other US cruisers as well. The flame and the smoke flowing over the amidship's gun deck blinded the surviving gunners in turn. In the struggle to continue, they could not see their targets, and it was impossible for most of them to know that their foundering ship had taken a decapitating blow. When the hit came to the Quincy's bridge, probably from the Aoba, most of the men on watch were killed at their stations. The Quincy's exec, Lieutenant Commander John D. Andrew, moved forward as soon as the fires aft allowed. He wanted to find his captain. He needed new orders to help direct the ship's gunnery and helm. He was stunned by what he discovered. I found it in a shambles of dead bodies with only three or four people still standing. In the pilot house itself, the only person standing was the signalman at the wheel, who was vainly endeavouring to check the ship's swing to starboard and to bring her to port. On questioning him, I found out that the captain, who was at that time lying near the wheel, had instructed him to beach the ship, and he was trying to head the ship for Savo Island, distant some four miles on the port quarter. Andrew tried to get a fix on the island as the helmsman sought to avoid a collision astern. At this instant, Andrew wrote, the captain straightened up and fell back, apparently dead without having uttered any sound other than a moan. Shortly before he fell, Captain Moore had ordered control of the ship transferred to Battle 2, 
the battle station of his executive officer, high in the tripod mainmast aft. When Andrew heard that Battle II had been hit and destroyed, he knew it was time to abandon ship. All life in two of the cruiser's fire rooms had been extinguished by a single torpedo. By 2.20, the fireboxes in a third fire room were swamped. One of Quincy's engine rooms never got the abandoned ship order. The final act of the chief engineer was to order a sailor forward to inform Captain Moore that the power plant was nearly inoperable. By then, the captain was already dead, and minutes after the messenger left, two torpedoes from the Tenryu struck the compartment, leaving that sailor as its sole survivor. As the Quincy's port rail touched the sea, the five-inch gun deck was engulfed. Flood water partly quenched the fires that blazed below decks. But the mercy of this happenstance was useless. At about 2.35 a.m., the Quincy rolled on her port beam ends and sank by the bow. Bereft of the company of her sisters, the Astoria faced a terrible struggle after the Japanese melted into the night, and the encounter off Savo Island was left to reverberate in the memories of a thousand lives lost. Like the Vincennes and Quincy, she had been gutted before her officers knew what was happening. Though some foresighted aviation machinists had drained the gas lines of her seagulls the night before, there was no shortage of things to explode. When the valve heads on some gas cylinders stored in the aircraft hangar became superheated, they blew spectacularly, and gas jetted high in the air, igniting as it went up like Roman candles, one sailor recalled. As an Astoria marine recalled, our ship was blazing like a straw stack on a summer night. In the northern cruiser force on its night of doom, a hundred small dramas played out. As the Astoria's executive officer, Frank Shoup, ordered Battle II abandoned, he saw that the fire on the boat deck had spread to the legs of the mainmast and was greedily climbing, devouring its smooth grey veneer. Battle II was the last refuge now of several dozen trapped sailors. On all sides, the ladders down to the main deck were blocked by the rising flames. All communications were shot away, Jack Gibson wrote. Our eyes were burning with smoke, and we were choking in the fumes of flaming diesel oil. Leaving the director and going out to the machine gun platform, Gibson found seven dead men, all heaped together behind the torn splinter shield in a jumble of arms, legs and broken bodies. They included Ensign McLaughlin, the machine gun control officer, killed with his crew before they ever got off a shot. Puzzlement, anger and frustration, not fear, were the predominant emotions of the moment. Gibson saw a fire controlman named Dean pull a large hunk of steel out of his thigh and throw it disgustedly to the deck. Gibson recalled, We salvaged the first aid kit from the control room and gave the wounded shots of morphine. Then I called down to the fantail for a fire hose. With help from sailors who had climbed onto the roof of turret 3, a hose was attached to a light line and tossed up to the platform. It didn't carry much water, it sputtered and went dead. Without a word, Gibson wrote, Seaman Barker went down the hot ladder to the flaming launches and hacked off a heavy coil of rope. Machine gun ammunition exploded around him, but he got back up with only minor burns. The improvised zip line had been singed badly enough to call its utility into question. Unsure of its strength, they puzzled how best to test it and finally settled on a coldly pragmatic method underwritten by a difficult moral calculus. They decided to try it on the worst of the wounded. An unconscious sailor was attached to the line and sent on his way, sliding down toward the roof of turret 3. He could not have been more than ten feet down, Wade Johns recalled, when the line went slack in our hands and we heard the crunching sound of his body after he fell that last forty feet. We checked every foot of the remaining line. We knotted it around the burned segments, checked again, and then began the successful lowering of the wounded, one by one. The Astoria was divided in two by a valley of fire amidships. About one fifty men were trapped on the fantail. They could get no word of their shipmates in the forward stations. With the fires amidships walling them off, they doubted there could be any survivors. We sat there while the fire roared amidships and our ammunition was blowing up. Gibson wrote, we were sure all hands forward were dead, while they never dreamed that anyone could have survived the fire aft. Wounded men were being saved in unlikely ways, in some cases delivered topside through large gashes opened up by the impact of enemy shells. The Astoria's bridge had an enormous section shot away, and her scorched hangar area was blackened. 
Her most threatening wounds were eight large shell holes located just above the torpedo belt on her starboard side. She was holed but seaworthy, and though many of her rivets were weepy, the larger penetrations were well plugged from within. As long as the port list could be controlled, the volume of water shipping in would not be fatal. Chaplain Bouters, seated on the fantail, was dangling his legs over the side and resting them on the welded letters spelling the name of his ship. There came a drizzle of rain, and he welcomed its coolness. The water below his feet was obsidian and foreboding, lit only by the flicker of flames and the little splashes of light that came whenever debris, cast by explosions into the sea, disturbed the plankton and stirred them to a momentary green glow. Here and there, fuzzy, iridescent streaks were swirled up by the baleful wakes of shark fins. Contemplating a world without a USS Astoria, Bouters found he could not take his eyes from a ghastly sight. One of our crew had been killed at his battle station at After Control, the tall superstructure just abaft the hangar, which contained some of our fire control equipment. His body had caught on the rail and was hanging there. The fire from below was coming closer and closer to him as I watched transfixed. I know I wasn't the only one of that group of dazed survivors who noticed our shipmate's body slowly shrinking as the flames consumed it. The thought never crossed my mind that I should try to climb up and pull that body down, and no one else moved either. A funeral pyre seemed symbolically appropriate in the last moments of our ship's existence, and, for all we knew, ours. One must only watch in dignified silence and say farewell. One sailor who was sent below to find some life jackets returned with a box of cigars. Bouters knew the kid. He had been trying to teach him to read and write. As he offered smokes to men clustered around turret three, the kid swelled a little as if he knew he had won a small battle. He shouted to the chaplain, Hey man, I just made chief the hard way. The sight of this sailor, cocky despite the circumstances, struck Bouters in the heart. I was back in a more familiar world where sailors could do crazy things like that, throwing the butchery of battle right back into the face of the enemy. The bitter laughter tasted good,